Right. Okie doke. So hello, welcome to the next yes. show and tell on the theme of superstitions. And it's a hard one to follow up from, mm. from Lisa and from Roger and Julia. But today we've got Jill, Glynis and oh, David. Sorry. So I really look forward to that. And yeah, if we could start with Jill, that would be great. Over to you, Jill. I'll spotlight you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I haven't um, done a I haven't done a presentation. I'm just going to read something out, and um, I'm a bit stretched at the moment. And I might mention a bit about that afterwards, actually. But so it's a, it's quite a quick thing. It's a bit of a stream of consciousness. But um, when I was when we were growing up at home as children, I was thinking when I was thinking about superstitions, I I kind of remember like our life was full of them. We were always navigating my mum's little superstitions. It was, I think about it now, a bit like a wood or a forest with loads of trees that we had to walk around and be careful of and mind out for this. And none of them made any sense, but we took them all very seriously. So this is a kind of response to living with all those little superstitions and little sayings that loomed large in our lives when we were younger it's a bit dark so i might struggle a bit to read my own writing so here it is <laughs> it's a bit weird good luck bad luck find a four-leaf clover careful with the mirror crossed fingers crossed everything break a leg if you bang one elbow bang the other one quickly your nose will get stuck in the middle of your face don't cross on the stairs but if you trip upstairs there will be a wedding unlucky in cards lucky in love Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. But don't look at the bride before the wedding. Lucky numbers, 8 and 44. Unlucky me, unlucky 13. Seven years, bad luck. One for sorrow, two for joy. Shoes off the table, umbrellas down inside. Wish on a star, the first fruit and veg of the new season. Whoever sees the sea first, when you blow out the candles. Don't tell anyone or else it won't come true. Seven for a secret, never to be told. Careful what you wish for, why? Best wishes, wishing prayer, I wish for you. I wish you were here, wish, wishing well. Chimney sweeps, black cats and horseshoes, lucky charms, don't look back, don't. Don't walk under a ladder, don't. A song on the radio, a lucky pair of shoes, omens good and bad, prevent, prepare, control, keep catastrophe at bay, the wolf from the door. Don't risk it, be careful, arm yourself, you need all the help you can get. Chance, magic, coincidence, irrationality, why not? Do you believe in things you don't understand? Did you do all you could? Good luck, I wish you well. <laughs> Yeah, now you mention it. Very poetic. They've all come back, flooding back. I could see that as a Bob and Roberta Smith painting. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Whole... With all the text, yeah. Yeah. Because it's so there's one you didn't have about don't step on a crack or you'll break your mother's back. Yeah. I, I, I really know. used to jump all the cracks in the pavement because yeah. I had no idea what it really meant. Oh, mm. oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, some, some of the things I remember being said to me when I was younger, you know, some of those, <laughs> those same. Yeah. And they all just loom large, don't they? You, they were just things that you navigated your life by without any understanding yeah. why or you know you just didn't do those things and i still if i bang one elbow i bang the other one and oh that mm -hmm. sounds painful <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit much i remember hearing that one though when i was uh, younger yeah. i don't know if it's particularly i mean i grew up in norfolk so i don't know what well, great yarmouth but so there was a lot of stuff around Norfolk that was yeah. superstitious. I thought people were incredibly superstitious. Actually. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder if they might be nearer the sea or something. I don't know if you were. It's weird yeah. as a child, as a child, what you're saying to is true. It is like negotiating your way through a forest of yeah. kind mm, of, like because, yeah, because 
you do believe most of what your parents tell you up until a certain point, and then it becomes a habit anyway. So you saying you still bang your other elbow doesn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, those things are deeply embedded, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Um, so where did you grow up then, Jill? I mean, whereabouts was it? In that? Reading. Reading, right. Yeah. Yeah. They're quite the... rural around there. No. no like, I grew up on a well, I started off in Reading, but most of our lives we lived in Woodley in just a big sprawling kind of council estate. It, no, it wasn't rural. It was very how, full of houses, really. Mm. Um, yeah. Because I'm just thinking, because where I grew up, it was a town. I mean, it's a small yeah. town, but around the edges of it, you've obviously got, um, well, you've got the Norfolk Broads and you've yeah. got um, marshes and all sorts of farmland as well. So I just wonder if some of those came from, you know, yeah. the countryside yeah. rather than yeah. emerged in the town I grew up in. Yeah. Well, it'll rather depend on where your mother came from, not you. Yeah. Well, she was. My mum was from the south coast. She was, she was from born, sort of born in this area. But funnily enough, not that it's very funny. But we didn't have a car, so we hardly went anywhere. So although we were near to lovely countryside, we mm. never went there. <laughs> we only ever got the bus into Reading or walked to the shops in Woodley. We really went very few places until I got old enough to get a bike. Then I realised how close. <laughs> yeah. Um, Marianne, can I do something shameless, please? Yeah. Go on, please, please do gonna be shameless um and already i've i've bothered people and roger's very kind of helped me so i'm in a bit of a pickle with my phd basically because my supervisors arranged for me to have another year which they said i needed which would have taken me up to january 2023 and they're now saying only just said Oh no, you haven't got that. So now you've got to hand in in January 2020, the next one, 2022, which is like suddenly to do in a few months what I thought I had 13 months is, is just crazy. So I'm kind of going all out and trying to solve everything all at the same time and spreading the load. And Roger's already kindly helped me by finding a couple of images. But one of the things that I've done is an interactive map of Hull with like all the public art on it so you like click on it and mm -hmm. then like a little symbol and then you get a bit of text or an image a photograph so you can imagine the sort of thing it is mm. only I was just talking to the supervisors today and they tonight before oh, before this and they said oh what about the images um, and I said, oh, I've done it like an interactive map. And they, oh, you can't do it like an interactive map. You can't do it on a website. You've got to do it like this. But never, oh, for goodness sake. Um, so I said, all right, well, so what's the problem with the website then? And they said one of their problems was you couldn't guarantee it would be there forever. If you know what I mean? Because if it's just Jill Howitt website, which is all it would have been, I could stop paying for it and it would disappear and you can't do that with a PhD. So I don't answer this now, but if anybody, if anybody's got any ideas, who would possibly host my public art map of Hull? They wouldn't have to make it public, but like somewhere quite um, with authority that aren't going to disappear in a year or two's time. What but, about the University of Hull? I could ask them, yeah. Or the History Centre, because that's where they keep all their archives. History Centre, yeah. Or or even someone that I vaguely know that I've got like quite a friendly connection with because I'm just having problems with authority at the moment. So I could, I will ask those people. But I, I was thinking about Matt Fratson because he yeah. spends a lot of time in the History Centre and they were very good to us when we did a thing together there. Yeah, um, I mean Nicholas runs it. He's really good. You might it might be worth chatting to him. Who's that, Glennis? Sorry, Nicholas Taylor, who runs. Does he still run it? The Martin Taylor. 
Martin Taylor, the history. Mm -hmm. He's a really nice guy, and he's very interested in people in you know history and everything. Obviously, yeah. But I can he, put you in touch with the university side of the whole history centre. Do you oh know her? She's called Claire Claire Wainwright. Um, I met Philip Cullen today. Yeah, so because right. university, you need you need a contact. Okay. You know, university okay. to contact as such yeah. isn't there yeah. <laughs> you won't well, get think on the black on the side so there's also the archivist there's a couple of archivists that work there who... that's claire wainwright she's that the claire archivist. all right and mark right. taylor's the archivist for yeah yeah right. yeah because it's split in two isn't it? it's run by the university yeah. and by the council in equal parts right maybe oh, arrange um, a meeting between like what and... what kind of a web are you looking, did you say you're looking for a website to host it? Well, at the moment, I was just going to set up my own one. So okay. but that obviously isn't very secure or okay. permanent. So I wondered if it's possible to just have a bit on someone else's that they don't even need to make public, but they well, might be interested. They in don't it. need to make public. Okay. Because mm -hmm. again, I think for those kind of things, you probably the university or the history center they won't be able to do that because those pages might be i don't even know i mean they that's the whole history yeah, they have a page it might be um, public. i have to be able to access it the university yeah, that, wouldn't be able to it on their site that wouldn't be possible yeah what about yeah the art school, did you say? Well, art school they have a lot of presence like caroline says they mm -hmm. might is it what about critical fish is that too close to home for you? I don't know. I, yeah, I, I think maybe they would accept that. Maybe they would accept Critical Fish. Although I know we're only as good as our next bit of funding, really. Yeah. OK, so you're looking for something. OK. To so just um, convince them that it, I don't know. But well, some, it's, some people produce books. I mean, if you do a book, and yeah. you because all books have to be deposited in the british library don't they if you get um you'd have to get an isbn oh, number what about what about the education department in the ferrens if there is such a thing anymore i don't know if there is the learning yeah. center whatever the it's learning. called yeah do you think though with a website surely you can capture it yeah it will be you, you should you should be i mean even if it leaves the internet you should have it should be able to be captured somewhere shouldn't it well i thought the whole thing about the internet was nothing disappears once it was out there that was mm. <laughs> it was out there. Mm. i pay very little a tiny fee per year for my website that is still not up and running yet <laughs> and, and, and and it's there nobody else can do anything with it well, I, put, where, I put everything on wordpress and i don't pay anything for that yeah I'm, that's what i'm gonna do but i know that it, some institutions will host so they've hosted artists so they control the website and then yeah. they give you a bit of it i yeah. don't know if that might be because they're looking at the host because it's who's hosting the website isn't it because they're yeah. the ones that pay for it but if a university is paying for their website it, it should never go unless the university goes under yeah. um and you can have a page that's designed and you've got a link to it but it hasn't been published yet so mm. i've just had an idea which might be irrelevant but couldn't you get an extension on the grounds of you having had covid Could yes I've got, yeah i have got i i spoke to my doctor yesterday she's given me a bit of time she was very understanding but it it's only as long you know i think she's given me six weeks which is yeah, but if you play on long COVID, yeah. I'm not saying they should use COVID like the government does for an excuse for everything, but it might be. I'm thinking you need someone like, well, a sort of equivalent to Chloe, Julia's daughter, oh, don't ask Chloe. who is an IT specialist. So they would be able to tell you how you could I with, in the and I think if I understand you right, Jill, you're looking for an organization that kind of whose website will kind of continue to exist. Isn't yeah. it? It's not the problem of creating a website and hosting it on there. I think, mm -hmm. as you all say that, you know, anybody can do that these days. It's about finding a home for it. But mm -hmm. what about the university that you're doing your PhD? 
Oh, no, I don't no. know. <laughs> they ought to be helping you. Put me, you put me off wanting to ever do any more education. I'm yeah. done with education. They should have given you, they should give you advice. Yeah, they I, should I, I'd, I'd give it back to them in a big box and say, right, you want me to do this, how do I do it? Yeah, I just want to keep as clear from them as possible. Yeah. Who are they, Jill? Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Think, can't we? we can all kind of go away and think a little bit. Yeah, if you would kind of need to describe kind of in three words what the kind of the organization should represent so it actually okay. reflects your PhD. Because, I mean, if there's, it obviously needs to tie in with the organization's mm. objectives and what yeah. they're doing, isn't it? And mm. if it's something that kind of fits with whatever they're doing because nobody's just going to put something up on their website that's not somehow linked no. to them yeah, it? So just have a thought Jill it, did, it did you mean like a national you know organization if it's really something that kind of ties in with with what they're doing yeah did, did you meet in the city of culture did you meet anybody from blast theory no um oh yeah no i went to talks about them and everything but i didn't because they them. do a lot of mm. they are really branching out and and they have a lot of archives and loads of massive projects all over the place but they do quite a lot of stuff on time-based art you know and, mm. and immersive art and work and art okay. uh, stuff that's performed in situs and stuff yeah yeah they came to hull recently didn't they yeah. that cycling project which yeah. is that's really right good. The recent one they did, yeah. yeah they're very, they're very fond of Hull, you see. They're very le I know they've got loads of connections in Hull. Mm. Where are they based, actually? Is it London? I think so, yeah. The guy I met when I was involved in it a little bit before I had my leg um, was a really lovely guy, actually. I, I mean, I'm trying to get his number or his name. I've forgotten his name. That's all. I got, I got a number. I got his card, I think. I got a card. Mm -hmm. He was a very nice man, and when they did the the Tesla thing, you know, with the electric cars, mm -hmm. that was that was the project in Hull. Um, it was set in the future. It was a sort of a telephone box thing, and people had to ring yeah. round. And you remember that project? It was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you know somebody there might be interested. Yeah. Caroline, by the way, you're in it. You're on the map. You're oh. on the city hall. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway let's move on but if anyone just put in the chat in the group on messenger if, but there's been some good suggestions there which i'll definitely follow it i'll definitely go to the history center and um, yeah. contact matt as well matt, matt fratson is yeah. really good i nearly had nervous breakdown just doing my degree as you will recall <laughs> and matt was very very helpful to me because he seems to have a lot of relationships with yeah. things to do with how and things to do with the history center yeah 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 and they were right. incredibly kind to us when we did the larkin thing there yeah. so you know Jill, you know, just bother everybody just <laughs> every, every single suggestion send something off to them thank you and if if anyone's got a little connection like you've got marianne just just yeah just send it because it's easier than those info apps, isn't it? Mm. You know, if you've got an actual. But let, let's move on now. Thank you very much for letting me mm. get a bit more help from everyone. <laughs> right. Okay. Shall we go to um, Glynis next? Because Glynis needs to go early. So. Okay. What, what, what's the subject again? Is it superstition? Because <laughs> I must admit, I haven't really. Superstition. Oh. Superstition. Superstition. Um, yeah. Um, Not suspicion. <laughs> suspicion. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, don't feel put on well, the spot, be... Glynis. It's, not, it's okay. You know, maybe shall we go to David first and you can have a little think about it. Well, I'm going to have to go soon. I mean, <laughs> um, I was just trying to think of something that I. Because I did think of something last time, and then because I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't do it. We did um, souvenirs before superstition. Oh, souvenirs was probably a better one, actually. Yeah, but um, superstition. Well, I did come across this superstition actually <laughs> in. Repetitively I'll just tell you a little story. Oh, come on. I'll go. Rhythm. 
Oh, you look like that's you've got right. a halo it's it's right. to your head, kind of Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> that would yeah, be that's right. just, yeah, that's quite good. Yeah, um, there was this um, superstition in when I was growing up, actually, again, and it started in school because it was this thing saying you couldn't, red and green should not be seen. Now, it's part of a bigger rhyme that goes through all the colours. I don't know if anyone else knows it, but red and green should never be seen. So um, basically, when I moved to London, I found, and I couldn't get over this green, so there's this, there's this superstition around green growing up in Norfolk, which is a very green, it's part of a very green area, you see, because you've got the broad, you've got the whole of East Anglia, and then, which has a lot of rural areas, but you've got this sort of superstition against green. So the nobody- Chinese, The Chinese think green's an unlucky colour. Yeah, so, so I, because I, my favourite colour was always green, so I had a bright green dress when I was at, um, around 10 or 11, nine, 10, that's sort of age. And that nobody liked it, but I did. You know, I really liked the colour. It was bright, quite a bright green. And then when I went to um, uni, no, I didn't go to uni, I went to nursing school. I, and while I was in London, I bought a load of wool and it was cheap. So it was Peruvian wool, I think, and it was red and green. So they had loads of red and loads of green. So I started knitting this jumper in red and green and various people along the way. So in London, they still said, why are you putting green and red together? And, um, and I said, because I like the colour, you know, I like the colours. So I knitted a feminist jumper with red and green. I knitted this big jumper that was green. And then it had a red um, women's symbol, you know, the, the biological symbol with a, a fist in the middle in red. And then I did some uh, diamonds. And, the and I love the jumper, but um, I knitted it while I, was while I was revising for my nursing exams. So I was knitting this jumper because um, it took me about six months to knit actually, you know, on and off. But along the way, people were saying, eh, you know, red and green. But that jumper ended up going around the world, not with me, but I went to stay with someone in Brighton and then it got nicked. Well, I'd say nicked. Someone, I must, I left it there and someone borrowed it, whatever. And then they took it around the world <laughs> with them. And then I, and then I thought, where's my jumper? So I got it back about a year later because <laughs> I had to write to the people in Brighton and say, can I have my jumper back? You know, do you know who took it? And someone went to Canada and all sorts with it. And um, yeah, so I got it back. And um, I don't really know what the end of this story is, really, but uh, um, I've still got the jumper. And eventually someone asked me to knit another one, but they, not, they wanted it in black and white, but I never knitted another one. Um, Red and green are the colours of Christmas, though. Yeah, I knew you were saying, and ours was blue and green should never be seen. That's really, yeah, that's really weird. And, that, and that, I always thought that was silly because you've got the sky and you've got the green trees and grass. But yeah. it's also because they're opposites, red and green. Yeah. And that it can make people feel uncomfortable mm. because of the way they wore together. Mm. Yeah, well, in hospitals, you have this superstition about red and white because it's blood and bandages. So it represents blood and bandages. So that was what I got told while I was growing up. And also when I was nursing as well, you couldn't put white and, um, and, white and red flowers together for patients. So there were these certain things going on there as well but um i don't know why i mentioned <laughs> that i think this is all just color psychology isn't it i, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if, if the red and green thing was a fashion thing that started sometime they wanted to you know it's probably linked to designers and fashion trends and things like that because i remember when i was doing needlework o level which i did can you believe um called needlework um <laughs> it was uh, we had all sorts of stuff like that you know things you could and couldn't do things you weren't allowed to do this was the mm. 60s, mad really. Yeah, the uh, 70s, the early mm. 70s. Well, mm. mid. I reckon it's a designer's sort of, you know, slightly controlling. But, you know, they have these things mm. that they have, yeah, they have these colourways and all these 
things they put out two, three years before, and then suddenly we're all wearing purple, you know, on winter. So or... manipulative then. Yeah, I don't know. Like the, have that. Just like the rest of superstition. Yeah, but I don't well, know. I think it's really intriguing because my grandma, my dad, and it goes back to kind of before fashion designers had a big influence, I think, on people. So, and yeah. it's the same thing. My dad still thinks blue and green. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember because it never made sense to me. I never yeah. understood what, what it was. Yeah. Why would two colors yeah. not go with each other? It's well, really, I, don't, really I don't get it either. Yeah. There's no such thing to me, you know. To me, there's no, no such thing. So. No, on the contrary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the more yeah. clashing, yeah. the better. Well, it, it was blue and green. It makes actually complementary colours. Well, that's about. what I meant, yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. It's it's not to put together, although they complement each other. Mm. It's it's psychology of colours great, and there are loads of superstitions like that. I know what you mean. Loads and loads of them, aren't there? Mm. Like, in, interior design, you know, interior designers, if you only have to go online, you start finding some new paint for your house, and it's all like all this stuff to come out with about, you know, this colour will change your mood to this and that. But there is something in it, I think. We did have a friend once when we lived in London who painted his whole big living room absolutely scarlet, pillar box red. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a killer to sit in, you know, it was an absolute killer. I, mean, we went, I remember we went for a meal once and we were like raging at the end of the night. It was really heavy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you, Car I remember you, Caroline. We've done some shopping in the front room, and then completely repainting it because you didn't like it. Oh, shock it! And we've done, we've made some shocking mistakes. We had a hat. No, hat. But I would have just learned to live with it because after <laughs> all that work, after all no, that work, we felt we felt like we were in the green room, and we felt like we were living in the, the Shape of Water. You know that film? Yeah. No. We thought they were actually inside the tank with the monster. It felt that watery and cold and horrible. There is so something it's like, between yeah. cold and warm colours, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's the they, thing. They, you know, there, there, there is a, a real mm. thing about mm. colour. Because mm. Roger's just turned the light bulb in our hall, and I don't know what's the light bulb, but the light's gone blue. It's horrible. It makes me feel yeah. shivery. Mm. It's, it's real, real white or something there's something they change they've changed because the led ones are much brighter aren't they they're brighter mm. white they're probably more bluer yeah. than the tungsten which is red is orangey the warm <laughs> color warm white <laughs> but um this thing about what was the what why a green What's room that? for green rooms are they meant to be green or is it just i think it's supposed to be green rooms are supposed to be calming but they're also supposed to be i mean I have heard that they're linked to um, people's getting depressed and suicide. I've heard that. Now I'm talking about the theatre because traditional. Oh, sorry. Oh, the green room. Oh, the green room. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really have a or something. They leave them in the green room. Yeah, they say, oh, yeah, the green room is this. I, it was this mystery room when I went into Leeds Playhouse once. It's like we, got, it's we ended up in the green room. And I was like, why, why is this green? It wasn't green. Ah, but it's a really good story. It's about. In Shakespeare's time, or when they used to have sort of um, mama plays and people used to go around the villages, but even before, you know, Shakespeare and all that, that before proper plays, they would set up their carts on the green, oh. in the village green. Mm. And they would just mm. gamble about, you know, just set up the old, whatever they were, you know, um, mm. tents and, and they'd have these carts. And it was always outside because everything was outside. There weren't any playhouses with roofs for hundreds of years. So that's why I would call the, so when they used to get ready, they used to say they're in the green room, meaning outside. Ah. It's weird, yeah. Oh, God. That's green. fascinating. Green used to be used a lot in hospitals, I think, because yes. it used to be thought it's of as being calming. Calming, yes, mm. for sure. Yeah. That's what I and I blue. I think of it as being medical and quite, yeah. you almost yeah. smell the kind of, cleaning fluids if <laughs> you see that kind blue, of green blue used to be used in larders because yeah. it, was, it was considered that flies didn't like it very much so it helped stop lots of flies coming in there you go i mean like it like we all know being artists of all different sorts that we know that there's greens and greens and there's pinks and mm. pinks you know i mean there's a whole amazing range of greens i mean 
Mm. Yeah, the green we chose happened to be very cold, you know, and, and watery. <laughs> it didn't work for us anyway. So. Well, yeah. I think my, my interest in doing this jumper actually in red and green in the first place was because everybody wore dull colours most of the time. Mm. And so, except on the beach, you know, I mean, obviously beach wear is quite brightly mm. coloured in the summer, but in the winter, everybody, where you need a jumper, everybody wore really, you know, there was, you couldn't buy wool very, very easily that was bright. So when I moved, you know, when I obviously, I moved, no, I bought it in Great Yarmouth, actually, this wool. It was um, in one of the wool shops down one of these, you know, like alley, um, they have these rows, you know, a bit like the Beasley's um, Arcade, but they're smaller, these little rows. And they used to have, there was a wool shop there and it had this, load of Aran wool. No, I bought the other wool somewhere else actually, but in uh, Blackfriars or somewhere, or um, Forest Hill, somewhere like that. But no, I bought this in Great Yarmouth. So it, it, they had masses of red and masses of green. And that was because no one wanted green or red. So I was able to buy tons of it, you know, like 10 balls of each mm -hmm. and knit this jumper with it. So, um, and it was Aran wool. And that amazed me. So I thought, well, it's good. No one wants the colours, but it was good to, to have those bright colours. Um, they didn't have yellow and they didn't have other, you know, oranges and things. They just had this red and green. So you love African fabrics and so many of those are brightly coloured. My daughter wears, yeah. she's got a jumper she had knitted of a Lichtenstein painting. Took oh. the woman ages. What's the one? What, what? What's it? Wham, wasn't it? Wham, yeah, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Oh. The, yeah, and she yeah. she had that knitted, but actually, if she if it's unlucky, my God, Chloe wears a lot of red and green. Does so. she? <laughs> well, she's very successful, isn't she? I mean, no. Um, <laughs> I think they're good colour. And I was successful in my nursing exams where the year I took my nursing exams, half of the set failed. And I sat knitting that jumper during my revision classes. And I, I wasn't I you could knit. And I was allowed to do it. With you. I was allowed to do it because I was listening and doing something as well at the same time. So because everyone else was writing notes, I thought there's no point in writing notes. I'm going to listen. I've written loads of notes. I'm listening. So it helped me to pass actually to, to do my revision. Mm. And um, this reminded me of Tom Daly in the Olympics. Do you remember? Mm. Oh, yeah, he knitted to me. He to his <laughs> Olympic jumper. Yeah, yeah. You can knit artworks, Linus. What? You can knit artworks. Like I embroider, you could knit artworks. I know. I have tried to. Yeah, I, I, I did go on to a, I did on a course actually in Lee, in London, which was a W, it was either a WAA course or an adult education course. And this woman uh, took us through what Mandy Race actually used to do at the college, which yeah, was she said. Nice up... I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I was talking to Dave, but oh. I have got, I have knitted a piece of artwork. Brilliant, brilliant. I did it when I was, when I was at school. One. It's it's a fully knitted um, script. I've still got it. I'm not sure where I put it. I'll find it there because it's it's ridiculously funny. It's the scream, but it's um, it was knitted on a knitting machine because our art teacher used to get uh, sort of specialists in different things to come into the studio sometimes, and hmm. nobody wanted to to do any knitting with the knitter on the knitting machine for some reason. <laughs> Because everybody you know, to set up, and it? You have to you set it all up. It's quite a time consuming. So I was like, well, all right, I'll give it a go. And um, yeah, knitting the scream. So I've got, I've got a knitted scream somewhere. It's, it's stupid. It's so like, how random. Brilliant. <laughs> when I was um, teaching at college, but a long time ago, so it was like the BTAC. Um, I used to have this pro project where I used to teach them about chair design and then I used to set them this thing where they had to design a chair for a famous artist so they would incorporate something about the design history and then something about artist research. Anyway, this student, it was such an amazing piece of work, I've never forgotten it. He designed 
a chair knitting, which was two knitting needles and a ball of wool and a strip of like a strip of knitting. So that was the chair and it was knitting yeah. itself. It was making itself. So you could imagine the knitting needles as legs and maybe I can't exactly remember. Maybe the ball of wool was the seat and then maybe the knitting was the back, whatever. But it, it was making itself. It was so clever. <laughs> One of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Marianne, we've got off the super, the... Yeah. Suspicious. 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 Time. Time. I, I apologise to me. <laughs> 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 you know, I don't mind. Never. Wow. Because um, I know someone's just embroidered the scream, haven't they? And the oh no, it's 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 some uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, no, um, Van Gogh. It's a Van Gogh painting, and she's embroidered it or crocheted it or something and she's um she's trying to raise money for something that it's on facebook it on Luck North, wasn't it, or something? yeah and she's it took her you know quite a long time to do it but she's just finished it so it's, it's up to 500 pounds i think now someone's offered but, um, maybe i should auction mine off it's a charity i think she's auctioning it for charity or something. i just did it because i thought what is the stupidest thing i can do on a knitting machine was the least knitting. You're doing the pose now. Yeah. You're doing the pose. <laughs> no, I was I was thinking about the guillotine then and women sitting knitting by the guillotine for some reason. <laughs> Which seems sort of why did they do that? It would have been the same with knitting machines. <laughs> <laughs> But this. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah. want to do a film with them sitting with knitting machines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think Roger's falling asleep. <laughs> really? it's, it's funny that you you said that about my face, actually, Glynis. I was saying the like that with the. But the reason I did the scream actually initially was because I was doing clay at school. And I started to do a face, and you know when you do that with your with clay, and you kind of put your that bit of your hand. This was when I was a teenager, and I was obviously like typical like teenager, you know. So as the more I did it, the more it started to make a face. But it wasn't a face with its mouth closed. It was a face with its mouth open because it doesn't do a closed mouth. So I yeah, I did that, and then that became like this face and that then I ended up doing the knitting mm. and it was because of that. I think, I think what you're saying there is making me think we went from um, souvenirs to superstition. <laughs> I'm thinking coincidence is quite you know fits quite into those same things actually coincidence serendipity all those sort of things they're all you know happen and you think mm. dances mm. Huh? excellently pulled together julia yeah well i can't imagine why <laughs> my brain stopped functioning that's why i said i'm not going to do any more education I, I like what you said earlier on, Jill, about how it was a, what did you call it, a flow of... Um, stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness, because I've been accused on many an occasion. <laughs> you, you just, even my son once said to me, oh, mum, you just go stream of consciousness with <laughs> all your talk. <laughs> so there you go. Anyway. Mm. <laughs> no, thank you, Glynis. Shall we move over to David? David. Uh -huh. <laughs> he has gone to sleep. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. I've woken up again. <laughs> you did go to sleep then. <laughs> well, my mind switched off. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I actually wrote this oh, ages ago. And um, there's no presentation with it. It's just a piece of writing. Um, when I started to think about suspicion, and I suppose you'd call it... Um, confused by superstition um well basically you're either superstitious or you're not my brother for instance is not superstitious and he laughs at anyone who is 
if you are superstitious, then the question is, how superstitious are you? Um, in my case, I would say I'm mildly superstitious. I say mildly because, like Jill's mother, my mother was seriously superstitious, <laughs> almost to the point of total absurdity. Uh, her vast knowledge of superstition seems somehow quite ridiculous. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why I suspect my brother finds it all so laughable. <laughs> we both used to have a laugh at it anyway. Um, still, uh, I try not to let superstition dominate my life. This would be quite a handicap. Obeying the rules of superstition day in and day out might lead to a a kind of madness, uh, albeit a very ordinary, everyday kind of madness. Um, superstition is a slippery slope, which if, if left unchecked, could lead to a life which can only be guided by the stars, palm readings or tarot cards. I will try to explain my attitude to suspicion with one small example. I once had to attend a crash course in what at the time was called project management. Uh, this entailed I'm going to travel up to London every day for a week, Monday to Friday, to join a class of about 20 of us working our way through a serious, 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 serious subject, uh, a series of modules led by a tutor. Uh, to put it bluntly, I felt out of my depth. The course was fast and furious. Lots of knowledge to take in, understand and apply in quick succession. I've always been a slow learner, used to working at my own pace. So I found the pace of this course very difficult to handle. Uh, at the end of the course, we were expected to take a test and we'd get a certificate. And... Uh, and that would give us the, uh, the relevant authority to project manage, which uh, whatever that meant at the time. It's, it, well, I don't know. Anyway, clearly I wasn't doing too well, even though I was burning the midnight oil, going over, over, the, way, over the day's work and the homework they gave us. I was scoring very low marks in the daily tests that the tutor set us. Even though I'd stayed up late the night before, cramming and revising as much of the work as I could. By Friday, I was less than confident that I would ever pass the exam. That Friday morning was a brilliant sunny day, I remember, as I walked to the bus stop to catch the bus that would take me to the station to catch a crowded train to London, to be crammed onto a crowded tube train to take me to the office block in the middle of the city, where we did the course. I just got to the bus stop when I glanced up at a tree nearby and noticed a magpie land. <laughs> Being mildly superstitious, as I say, I saluted the bird. Uh, after all, uh, it was a very important day to me and I couldn't afford to take chances. Just, just, just as I did this, um, another magpie landed in the tree. Um, I remember vaguely that this was, wasn't too bad an omen, but for a moment I felt reassured. A second later, a third magpie joined the other two. This was too much. I immediately thought, is too good? If two magpie are good, then three has got to be bad. Magpie in the plural. Which was correct. I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't at all sure what the recollection of magpies were. One, two, three, what did they mean? Maybe I was wrong. Suppose for instance, it happened that two magpies are bad, then maybe three magpies are good. What do you do if a fourth turned up? <laughs> the mind boggles. This was total confusion, but it didn't help me at all in coping with my worries about the day ahead. Even I, even I couldn't help feeling that the magpie phenomenon was bound to be inextricably linked with my fate that day. Whichever way it went. Well, I did pass the exam. Proof positive, I suppose, that three magpies in a tree is a lucky omen. Well, for me anyway. 
It's it's one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. Irrelevant to you. <laughs> Absolutely irrelevant, yes, exactly. So oh, the, the moral it's is... one bird on its own when it hasn't got his mate is unlucky because it means something's happened to its mate or, or they're divorced. <laughs> no, but you can say something to counteract that. You can say, um, hello, Mr. Magpie, or hello, Mrs. Magpie. How's your husband? How's your wife? And well, that implies that you're talking to two of them. <laughs> You've got to salute them. So well, I, I do that. I do. If I see one magpie, I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, having, having you said that about your brother, and I went, your brother's not here, but when I think about the things you say about your brother, I've often thought your brother obviously lacks imagination. <laughs> and I think imagination is what cripples artistic people with all kinds of superstition. I think, I think it's, well, yeah, it's because it's, you can't be imaginative without thinking, oh, that fairy tale might have some re just like you and oh there's a magpie up there yeah absolutely doomed if you're an artist doomed there's certain there's certain truth in that he's a more down to earth person than i am and i mean it's more brass tacks and all the rest of it oh, so i mean uh he isn't going to be um he isn't going to be sort of like whimsical <laughs> in that sense so um yeah that's probably why he's not um he's not turned on by superstition uh, and I do envy him in a way because I mean, it's, it's there's no question about it. It's um, it's one or the other. You either are or you're not. And if you're not, you're not. And but most people touch wood, don't they? Yeah, well, he, well, he doesn't. He doesn't. I, we were walking through a car park, and I said, "Well, you know, I had a lot of. Uh, we were talking about cars, what car we would buy, and all this sort of thing. And I said, "Well, I've had, I've had a lot of luck with my car. It hasn't broken down or anything like that." touch wood and I walked over to a post and, touched touched. It. and my brother said you what you what you superstitious worse than my mother and blah 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 our I, mother you know, <laughs> well, our mother well my man you know that would, that's what he yeah. would say and I thought well um yeah he's pretty right, <laughs> he's, right. He's, older, he's older than you he's probably just rebelling mm. against his mother Yes, definitely. Well, we both were at the time because it did seem ridiculous. It's like what Jill was saying about, um, you know, having a phrase for everything, you know, um, it, what can you do? It's, it's just... Um, yes, but it's, it's so imaginative, really, all that imagery, all that beautiful imagery that your parents, you know, it, it's terrible in, one, in the one way, but then when Jill used that image of negotiating your way through a forest, Maybe our parents were actually the ones who were superstitious were quite good because they made us more imaginative people, except in your brother's case, obviously. <laughs> oh, I, thought, I, I, I tend to think it leads to a life of confusion. Not the only culture that happened there. Cultures all around the world have superstition. It's not just in, in the UK, it's everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I well, think I mean, it's, it's it was, a throwback to when we didn't have, you know, to when people lived more lives connected to the earth and, you know, like farming or, or um, yeah. I mean, it, it's a throwback to sort of like a past uh, cosmology in a sense where we do sort of are aware of things a lot more. I mean, maybe the, I don't know where the cuckoo thing comes from. I mean, it was certainly the theme tune for the Cuckoo program, which was all about exploring myths and legends and all sorts of things and new inventions as well in the world. But they used a very old song for the program. And actually, a lot of parents wouldn't let their kids watch Magpie. I remember my mum certainly, we had to watch Blue Peter, which was on exactly the same time on the other side. So you could say that Blue Peter was the sort of British colonial um royal kids program and then magpie was the sort of um too cool it was it was we weren't allowed well i think a lot of people thought it was it was mad it was uh witchcraft mm. which a lot of these suspicions allude to as well a sort of witchcraft of you know pagan 
um, before we <laughs> before we all had to embrace Christianity and yeah um, and, and not, what that's done for and us. get rid of all those suspicions, you know, because that's what the witch trials were all about in the. I was just describing the fact that magpies like lots of little bitty things. It was like a magazine thing. And they take a little bit here and a little bit there and they show you different things. That's why it was called magpie. I remember reading that years ago. Well, I, was, I used to watch magpie. And that's what it was, like all these little programs yeah. for kids. They're, they're like little bits of jewels here and there, little nuggets yeah. of things. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, like that. Yeah. I think you probably read, I don't know whether people were reading too much into it at the time, but then I, I know it was a very different atmosphere, but those two programs were very different, you're right. One was much more young, I think, the other one was much more, as you say, established more, wasn't it? Well, no, I think the magpie, you see, with the with Blue Peter, they did have the, you know, they often had allusions to the Queen and... The, oh, absolutely, yeah, it was well, very family. And also they had stuff with the guides and the brownies and the brownies and the guides are all connected to the church. Mm. Whereas magpie was, was, so, was totally apolitical. No, yeah. it was, it was political in a different sense. It, and it was totally a, a religious, you know, you didn't have any religion. You had more, more, well, you had a different type of, I was quite drawn to magpie, but I was never allowed to watch it. So I never watched it growing up. I had to watch it like later on YouTube or whatever. But but I did, I like science programs and I used to try and get my mom to watch it. We did watch it a few times because I said, I was pushing the science in it. You know, I was saying it's, it's really good because they have all this science stuff in it. Whereas Blue Peter was all about sticky black plastic and making stupidness sometimes, you know, so. Um, Whenever yeah. Christianity <laughs> can't defeat something, it sort of embraces it. So Christmas and all that stuff is really pagan stuff. Yeah, I, much prefer, I personally much prefer all the superstition and pagan stuff. But mm. Christianity was a way of kind of, you know, controlling again. And um, yeah, so I'm all for superstition. I think I think it shows imagination, you know, mythology and whatever. Christianity, but, you can. Is superstition an old-fashioned thing? Because I'm thinking, is it something that's on the way out? Um, I tell you what, like I think, David, I think, in my generation, his parents grew up during the war, and that I made think, something to boost their superstition, which uh, you know, the fear of having a bomb dropped on you or uh, mm -hmm. your partner being away fighting possibly um and then they obviously sort of passed it on to to us but you know, i think i uh, think i have a theory that superstition has morphed into conspiracy theories ah interesting mm. i think i think if you really start to link about how now we can be our own experts or we think we can just by a swatch of a button when superstitions were about things we couldn't quite understand, or it was mystery, it was magic, it was, as, as you say, Glyn, something about the green way back when we were linked to our, the earth much more, much closer. Well, it's the and green think, man, isn't there? The green man appears as a... I think green. it's something to do with, with um, oh, yeah. the sort of stuff you can read now. It's only, it's pushing it to the ultimate, isn't it? To be su mm. superstitious and, and thinking that things are not as they should be. It, if you I don't. Especially me, Caroline, because you've, you've just damaged my whole premise of life. <laughs> <laughs> because there's all these people <laughs> calling the vaccine snake oil and all this sort of well, stuff. I, I, I was going to say, you know, when we saw that invasion of the the White House, there was yes. a shaman there, wasn't there? Yes, oh, yeah. yeah. yes, and, yeah. and, uh, and everything. Um, it was it was kind of it's twisted. It's a twisted very, version. Very strange kind of uh, throwback yeah. to uh, you know um, Krampus primitive and primitive knowledge. Oh, oh. It actually it's quite sinister because it's closely linked to Nazism. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's that thing of Wotan, isn't it? And that was something that influenced um, the Nazi party a lot. Yeah, and that's why I'm linking to what Roger was saying, because I think it's morphing in, you know, it's a massive jump. I know it sounds a bit like a jump, but I think if we start to 
put all the little subtle links together about how technology and all our common ground and all the stuff we think we know about each other now we can at the touch of a button we can get anything we like to think is an expert mm. you know it's very terrifying i mean I don't really know what Krampus is about. Somebody just mentioned it, but I bought this for, oh, yeah. for my son. Krampus is fascinating, yeah. I don't quite know what they do, but this, is it, it's not Spain, is it? What is the it? Evil Companion to Badness with like, it's like Christmas. A Christmas thing. Chloe bought me a, a it's alternative Christmas. Christmas. hang on the tree and ornament, but I bought this for my son Nick because I'm a bit fed up with him at the moment. <laughs> so, it's interesting that come up at the moment because it's very trendy at the minute Krampus it's in every all all trendy Christmas decorations are Krampus based it's ah, fascinating. Krampus. so many this year and it's all like why are they doing Krampus suddenly and it's a sort of alternative almost like a stitching rebellion thing mm. um, I've heard of Krampus. You know, and I'm classing everything it has together a bunch of sticks and they all march can... through the streets don't yeah. they Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I think it's fascinating that it's now because I think there's so many things going on that we're all fighting. We're all fighting lots of different sort of like fronts, aren't we? Mm. And I think, I think it's like, no, you know, there's like, yeah, keep on, you know, selling Asda at Christmas and all that. You know, millions of Christmas ads you get all the time that make you want to heave. And, yeah. and then you get, and then you get, the opposite at the moment as well. It's like, it's very, very, very odd. Talking about the nut, I mean, I don't mean to get too heavy, Marianne, but I did actually spend two hours talking with very strong um, conspiracy theorists recently around a table where I, I didn't know they happened to be. They were around somewhere where I went to visit a friend and they were there. I didn't know who they were, I'd never met them. And I decided I would talk calmly with them about it all. And um, they were, and they were, you know, very, you know, pleasant and clamped with me, you know, we won't screw each other or anything. But it was so extraordinary because they did actually mention Nuremberg. And these were these were people who were really articulate, extremely intelligent young women, they were probably about 35, maybe 40. And I just couldn't, I was just fascinated with their their certainty and their apparent expertise on all this stuff. And this, the fact that they truly and absolutely believed in, in, to me, a completely extraordinary superstitious way that there was this massive world, um, world, what do you call it, um, conspiracy of, you know, uh, it just went on and on and on. And it was all the stuff they'd, that they'd been reading online. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the first to be very cynical about governments in the state, but my God, talking to these people, it was fascinating. Fascinating. Well, I, found it, I found it quite disturbing because our son Daniel went to Wales um, and they booked this place a long time before. Um, and they're very, the children like doing lots of outdoor activities. And they booked this place because there was like a beaver pond there and they could go canoeing. But when they arrived and they were wearing their, I think a day before or something, they, they had an email saying, we are not part of the conspiracy, you know, whatever. And Danny and the children, they still turned up the next day wearing their masks and they were quite annoyed, the people. And yet the time Danny spent there, he said it was amazing because they were, it's easy to just think they're bad people or stupid people who are promoting these kind of conspiracy. But actually, Danny said what was most weird about it was that, you know, they were really nice and they were living a life of trying to live off the land and be. Yeah, you know, I, 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 mean, I, I think they're all bad anyway. Yeah. So it was really kind of through Danny's head I think into a you know because they weren't I mean the children had a wonderful time because they went to see beavers and yeah. they went canoeing and they did all these things in this quite wild part of Wales and and I think it really kind of confused Danny and yeah. I was a I must, I I was quite I angry can't. saying why did you go there if these people but after I thought about it I thought well do you know what? If you don't talk to people like you did, Caroline, yeah, you've got to talk. You've got to become, 
We've got to talk, I think. It's just ridiculous to just ignore it all. The more talking we... theory on it. I've got a theory on the fact that there's some there's a lot of suggestibility when you when you're doing when you're very open like to to being looking at different ways and looking at uh, being sort of um, holistic and <laughs> things like that. There's it, it, you are quite suggestible, and I think um, I think it can make you suggestible quite easily especially with meditation and things like that, I think he can become quite suggestible. So I think mm. I'm not sure if that has been something that they've taken Major. advantage of online. Well, it was you very should read a book called, have you ever read the book? I might've mentioned it before. Fast thinking, slow thinking by Daniel M. Kahneman. And yes, we are in, everybody is incredibly uh, easily influenced. It's so, yes. so easy. It's actually, that it's sounds scary. interesting, Marianne. That sounds an interesting book. You I should actually, well, honestly, because I think I've everyone should really it, be aware of right, how easily we are influenced and form opinions and prejudices. Yes. And yes. yeah, I think it should be taught at school. But I think it does sound really interesting, Marianne. Somebody's talking. I can't hear it. Sorry, who's that? That, that sounded in interesting. Mm. What was the author again? Daniel. Kahneman, it's spelled K A H N E M A N N. Um, yeah, it's it's basically our instinct, you know, that kind of makes those fast decisions and yes. we immediately kind of judge people. Yeah. But you know, we give people like halo effects just because they might like wear glasses, we think they're intelligent. So that's all kind of very basic. <laughs> I love that. I love that. that, that slow <laughs> thinking where we just <laughs> <laughs> where we need to interrogate. I mean, even if you look at films, isn't it, how the baddies are always portrayed? We've been kind of conditioned. Oh, stereotypes, to... archetypes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Mm. Anyway, but what I wanted to say briefly is as well, because it's the reason why we actually started talking about superstitions and what we kind of explored. It came from kind of those, those memories and souvenirs, but because we did think it's based very far back in our history and kind of was yeah. a tool to kind of protect us from not, you know, from things when people didn't have the science to understand what exactly works, you know, and kind of superstitious yeah. something that kept people safe. So I do think that's, that's something that kind of goes back really far and that gets kind of passed on. And I suppose the reason why, I, oh God, the reason why I mentioned it mm. was because these people were almost accusing me of being superstitious in that I believed in the virus. I, so that I, A, that I believed that you could get it from droplets and also B, that I actually had the, the vaccinations. So I was, ex, I was sort of in a really interesting situation where I had to examine my belief system about vaccinations because we really were trying to debate or at least try and reach out to each other. Do you know what I mean? It was, mm. it was the most, I came away, I was, my brain was completely... Uh, ironically, I'm thinking about women who practiced herbalism and all these things where there, were, there is a genuine, uh, you know, the plants that are used in medicines mm. even to this day and mm. the funguses and the various things that are used and discovered. Mm. When those women were described as witches, often they were the only people that um, you could go to to help you with something. Mm. Um, and, you know, they're all ridiculed with things like, you know, rubbing a toad on your nose because you've got a wart or something or whatever. But actually, a lot of those things had have come to pass that they were things that they have used in modern medicines that they of discovered mm -hmm. so those women were oddly kind of scientists mm -hmm. and yet they were considered yeah. to be early medicine wasn't it really obviously yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they were exploring you know uh, how, how uh, mm -hmm. and i think what you just said then was really interesting that they thought you were the one who was <laughs> yeah i was i was the one who was you know, not 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 getting down with the hard facts of it. You know, and uh, it was just very interesting. Be on I'm the other side. To, I'm going to have to go now, but because um, uh, I've got to get somewhere. But um, yeah, it's been really nice chatting to everybody, and um, 
I think this subject is really interesting. It's cultural, really, isn't it? It's a culture. It is very much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much cultural. And we have to, I suppose we have to do like Carol says, listen to what yeah. people are saying. I've come across quite a few anti-vax because at the moment we're living through all these conspiracy theories with COVID. With, and I mean, I've gone on to the world, I went on to the World Health site and looked up every vaccine and the ins and outs, how they discovered, how they've how the research we, we were actually i just think well in a sense we're all being guinea pigs by a lot of the stuff that we you know so we we have to accept that really and the food we eat and everything so i think this time we're living in the age of aquarius it's about just looking at everything really and examining everything examining all our sus suspicions and superstitions and just seeing where just sort of thinking about where they come from, I suppose, for me, it's like, you know, just learning a bit more about, you know, say my, and also other cultures, you know, my African culture, what, you know, there's a lot of things within that, that, you know, I would go, well, why are you doing that? Why do you do that? This is, this is, uh, but where, I don't know where it all comes from. So it's finding out where, where all these things come from. And then, well, for me, for me, playing with them really, you know, it's like there's quite an interesting. In the end, it's about the cause and effect for me. You know, it's about uh, society and bigger, bigger things than me. I'm, I'm happy to be in a pig if uh, if the world is better for not having polio. You know, that's how yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah. I see it in a very, very, very clear and black. Or, I'm very rarely black and white, but there are some things in life, and this is one of them. It's funny, isn't it? I don't know why that is. Probably for my family, I think. Yeah, we had certain things that happened in our family and uh, vaccinations saved, saved, you know, saved. Well, I'm, I'm into vaccine. My whole family, I grew up with nurses. So yeah. you know, I've got a lot of, yeah. you know, I wash my hands all the time. And, and it, I, for me, I think the, the, the whole crisis has made people be a bit more hygienic, you know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> you know. Nice thing, but who yeah, knows? It's true, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll have a good um Cheers, Glynis. Yeah. Nice see you, Glynis. Thank you. Are you going to do live drawing, Glynis? Is that where you're off? No, I've got to take something back to the Library of Stuff. And it's supposed to be there before seven, but it's ten two now. So I'm gonna oh, to get your skirts off. I'm cycling now, yeah. So <laughs> hope yeah, I get them in time. You. All right. Nice you better get you. off. Bye. Nice to see everyone. Anyway. Bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. knitting. Oh, thank you. I think it's it's been lovely again hearing all those conversations, and I love the the tangents we go off on. And I think there's so much. I think it's such a rich subject, and it's almost it's all psychological, isn't it? And neuroscience and yes. history all intertwined because we know so little, and we forget as well. I think actually superstitions kind of can take us back to understand who we were and kind of who we kind of still are and i think especially like in your talks it's it's often just a generation back isn't it to kind of our mm. parents or grandparents who were still so much more superstitious than than we are now but our kind of superstitions just moving into a different area of our kind of deep dark psyche you know where now we think oh god we, we know everything you know kind of the universe is clear as yeah. everything because we've got science you know, but science actually isn't crystal clear. And I think that's what you all said. It's about COVID. It goes back to that. It keeps coming up because it's such a sign of our time and it makes us question everything. And all of a sudden, science isn't crystal clear again. And, and we kind of revert back to something that feels right. That's an instinct more than actually knowledge. And again, actually, I'm coming back to that book because he actually explains that we just can't process often all the information. So we take these fast Cuts, that's, that's these, what I was cuts, to... these fast routes because we can't and but it's about knowing that that's what we do and not thinking that's the right way so it's a really it's just understanding ourselves and who we are and actually not blaming other people who might take those shortcuts it's just yeah it's yeah. It become so so difficult as a world it was and pretty good at least sure. isn't it? those old fast routes are just nice and easy anyway so again thank you it's been we think they are can i just that? mention on superstition before we go my number one screwdriver yeah. Whoa. <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's a new addition but it's gone straight into number one because 
it was left by the gas man who found it after, under, this, under the bath after he'd gone. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want it back. Well, he hasn't come for it. So, uh, <laughs> now, I was thinking, like, this has got some sort of magical knowledge inside it. It's far better than the others. <laughs> 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 Yeah. So I wondered why you were carrying that screwdriver around. <laughs> I've got things like that. They're little talismans, little things that I've got that I think, oh yeah, if I do that, that's lucky. I wanted yeah. to ask if, if there's a, because we're having an exhibition on, on Saturday and Sunday in town. Mm. Um, so um, just wanted to let you know, basically, and, how, and just to say it would be really lovely if any of you wanted to come. It's on from 2 30 and then it's finishing at six although we might just carry on drinking if we're having a good time but <laughs> but it's yeah from 2 30 i think there'll be something significant on but it's about 4 4 30 so if you're wondering about getting your shopping in or anything like that try and be there for sort of 4, 4 30 because I think there'll be something significant worth seeing. Is that a chance It's, it's no. a Saturday and Sunday, is it? It's on Saturday and Sunday, but try and make it for the Saturday if you're undecided. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go for Saturday for 4, 4 30 for those that want to be there when other people are there. Mm. But if you just rather just turn up and go kind of mosey in and mm. you know for a social Saturday four thirty ish, um, we we're we it's it's opposite. Do you know where Cash Converters in town is? Yeah. It's opposite there. It's kind of near the BHS building, near the near the three ships. It's um, next to Lush, isn't it? If you just kind of yeah. walk past Lush and then there's, I think, one place and then it's it's Harry, isn't it? It's called Harry. Lush. Yeah. It's Edward Street then. Isn't it? Yeah. That's right. That's right, Michelle. It's King Edward Street. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So actually that reminds me because I was going to say a couple of things as well. One is... Um, mm -hmm. So Shirethorn House, or basically Barney and, and Sean are putting together a, mag a magazine called um, Horn, a thorn in the side of the creative sector in Hull. And they've been asking for contributions. It doesn't have to be long. It can be an artwork, it can be a picture, it can be a short, short written piece. And I, I ask whether, you know, I can kind of extend the invitation to kind of the lockdown still lives group because obviously the space is as part of the lockdown still lives group so if you have like a poem or something that you feel kind of you'd like to submit you know send that to me and i'll it needs to be kind of if you could send it yeah by tomorrow it needs to be with barney and ian uh but i keep saying ian sean by friday but yeah just if you have a if you have a little thought and yeah i have a couple of ideas i might get in touch with some of you but yeah and then obviously the other thing is that Christmas swap and I think yeah Caroline I can't believe that's your birthday that's amazing so I'm, I'm a bit heartbroken that I won't be able to come along because I think that's the Shirethorn Christmas party I'm also gonna miss Craig Charles at the Students Union but um, if any of you fancy coming along in the afternoon and bring a few of your old knickknacks or just things that you want to get rid of and i think all the rest that doesn't get or that gets left if people want to take things back obviously take it back but the rest will be donated to charity and if anybody kind of has bags of things they can't bring in but want to get rid of i'm happy to come by and pick it up as well so yeah that's kind of a few things as well so Anybody else, anything to share, invite, could make this a bit of a sharing at the end of the, of the kind of... Can I, can I ask, just, just to play devil's advocate, why they think they're a thorn in the, in the uh, side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think it's, why? Yeah. it's doing things differently, I think. Um, That's just being, I'm putting a, I'm just sort of thinking, I'd like to quite know how they're, what it's there. interesting that I don't know. I, I mean, I when I read it, I was like, yeah, good. You know, I think it's more about 
because it's independent. It's not funded by any of the bigger organization in Hull. Nobody's yeah. really controlling it as such. You know, it's, it's a completely free, independent, floating, no welcoming. I mean, nobody's excluded from it as such. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's just a bit the idea of, yeah, challenging and being different. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that everybody in the building is like that though. Just some people <laughs> that want to have, do you know what I mean? It's not like, a, it's every art form in there is different, isn't it? There's all a real mixed bag of different styles and stuff. It's just, your, um, it's just your viewpoint, isn't it? From where you're working really. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good name. <laughs> Name what the play on the play on the words of Shawn, isn't it? It's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I hadn't actually thought of that. Of course, exactly. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. I think you know Barney yeah. and Sean are both into their provocations, yeah. so it is a provocation as such. I put things out there. Then, then you start thinking about sand in oyster shells and what happens then. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The grit. Grit. Yeah. 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 It comes yeah. pose. Oh. I enjoy seeing their posters put up around or, or bits of sort of, um, you know, just words they put around or little notices. I think yeah. they're, they're really interesting when you walk around seeing them, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Martin's put some of his work up in the... It, it's good. just such a brilliant space to kind of yeah, good, yeah. have it's your good. own exhibition. And just it is, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Oh, and yeah, I hope you can all make it to Sarah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go now. Sarah, it really, really does. Yeah. I hope to see you, Sarah, as well. I'm going to drop by. Are you going to document it in, in some shape or form? So um, I, can, I can enjoy. I know I'm, I can come another time, but even are you going to do performances and stuff? If there, yeah, if anything like that happens, I hope. I've got to go see you with the Bye. Okay. Bye, Caroline. Uh, oh, bye. Um, we haven't got an official way to record things, actually. We haven't got... So one of the things that I'm doing is, is, is kind of... In, it's interactive. But... Dave's said we're filming it. But how are we filming your things? How am I filming this? We'll talk about that later. Yeah, do. do <laughs> it would be great. I'd love to see it at some point. If anybody wants to film us. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, okay. Thank you all so, so much. Have a lovely, lovely evening. I'm going to have cabbage and bacon. Do you guys know that dish? That's, yeah, I think I've had that before. I think it's a very Yorkshire dish. Oh, and yeah. I love it. Martin introduced me to it. It's just literally cabbage and bacon and it's the most like mm -hmm. cooked for quite a while with like bubble and squeak. anyway mm. have a lovely evening <laughs> bye. Right, bye, bye. Oh, bye sorry bye. sorry i just quickly bye. actually chill because no put it in the put it in our chat you know your request from mm. earlier because you know there's more people here now who might have really good ideas thank you there. okay bye Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.